everybody's so quiet. Welcome to worship. My name is Beanie Kelly. I'm the associate pastor here. Pastor Chris is recovering from COVID. She's still fatigued and will be worshiping with us from home. So hello, online friends and Pastor Chris. I'm so glad you're here. Welcome in the name of Christ. It's a great day to worship our great God. I'd like to invite you to let us know that you are here um, via the QR codes in the pew, or you may sign um, a registry as you go out on the right. So I would like you to greet each other in the name of Christ. Please remain standing while you're up. I invite you to stand as you are able as we join together responsively with our call to worship and your words will be in white. The God of all creation makes us one in the flesh. Let us join hearts and voices in praise. In Jesus Christ, we are made one in the spirit. Let us be united in truth through the same one spirit. We practice our faith in many different ways. Yet we confess one Lord Jesus Christ. We render different forms of ministry. Yet our calling is one because Christ is undivided. Rejoice, people of God. The risen Christ is among us, calling us together at his one table. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. Please remain standing. Absolutely. As we continue our service with our opening hymn, 546, you'll find the tune on 545, but we'll use the words on 546. Verses 1 through 4. The church is one foundation, is Jesus Christ our Lord. We are his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought us that we might ever be. His living servant people by his own death set free. Called forth from every nation, yet one for all of the earth. A chart of salvation, one Lord, one faith, one birth. One holy name professing, and at one table fed. To one hope always pressing, by Christ's own Spirit led. Though with a scornful wonder, the world sees us oppressed. By schisms rent asunder, by heresies distressed. Yet saints their watch are keeping, their cry goes up how long. But soon the night of weeping shall be the morn of song. Mid toil and tribulation and tumult of our war, we await the consummation of peace forevermore. Till with the vision glorious, our longing eyes are blessed. And the great church victorious shall be the church at 
Amen. Hold on just a moment. Good morning. How you doing, Graham? Good morning, online friends. We're glad you're here. Let's sing it one time for the kids. This, this is where children belong. Welcome as part of the worshiping throng. Water God's word, bread and cup, prayer and song. This is where children belong. Glad y'all are here today on this cold and rainy day. So raise your hand if you know this book, The Little Blue Truck. Do you know it? This is one of my granddaughter Delta Rosa's. Great. Great. You can help me tell the story. And you can help, because some people might not know it, and you can help me tell what happens. So there's a little blue truck in this book. What's his name? Blue, right, Jacob. His name is Blue. And Blue is always so nice to everybody, isn't he? Blue is nice to the cow and the pig and who else? The sheep and the horse. Right, yeah, and the duck. Yeah, all of those. Blue is always so nice. And then there's somebody else in the book. And the rooster. And the rooster, right. There is also the dump, which is a big dump truck, and they call him the dump, right? And he is so big and so important that he doesn't think he needs to take time to be nice to anybody, does he? No, he's just kind of old grouchy. Do you remember what happens to the dump? What happens, Sydney? He gets stuck. Where does he get stuck? In the mud. He gets stuck in the mud, right? And he's just kind of stuck there. So who comes to help the dump? Blue comes to help the dump. He does. Even though the dump wasn't very nice, little blue was nice, right? But blue was really little and the dump was really big, so what happened to blue? He got stuck in the mud too, right? So now they're both stuck. So who comes to help blue? Who? I know, which ones? The horse. Who else? The sheep, the cow, the duck. And the rooster. They all come to help because Blue was so nice to them that they wanted to help Blue. And so they helped Blue push the dump out of the mud, right? Yeah? Isn't that what happened? Yeah. My favorite part is on this page. This is near the end. There's one page after, a couple pages after that. It's near the end. And the dump says, here's what the dump says. It's really important. The dump says, now I see a lot depends on a helping hand from a few good friends. A lot depends on a helping hand from a few good friends. And you know at church, when a few people help, do something, then a whole lot can happen, can it? And like with blue, we are never too small, we're never too old, we're never too big to help. What are some ways we can help other people? What, Abigail? Help your parents around the house, see? I mean, I'm Madison. Yeah, help your friends, right. Well, in a few weeks, Shady Grove children, which is all of you, are going to be collecting donations for Rise Against Hunger, and that helps people who are hungry. And we're going to be talking about lots of other ways that we can help. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus. Who showed us that we are never too small, We're never too old old to help others. 
Thank you for showing us how. We can help and share your love. Amen. Okay, we're going to go to Sunday school and we'll go up on the side over there. I'd like to invite Michael and Susan to come forward. Michael and Susan Hyder are coming to us from Emory United Methodist Church in Emory, Virginia. Um, far, far west. <laughs> far, far west. And they came about in the summer. What month did y'all come? June 15th. June 15th, not to be exact, June 15th. They, <laughs> Very well. They, it was a holiday of 2022, I think. Was it? <laughs> so they came uh, to visit, and they, they were on a plan of, of trying out different churches. But y'all were so welcoming and so lovely that they chose to stay. Um, so we are very excited about that. So I ask you, are you ready to discover and live the love of God with us here at Shady Grove? If so, you say yes. Yes, we are. Yay! <laughs> Talking about helping hands, they helped decorate the church uh, for our Advent season, and they are also very vital parts of the 1050 Sunday School class. Um, so I urge you to come introduce yourself uh, to Michael and Susan. They are wonderful people, and we are so excited to have y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Our newest members. Yeah. Please join me in our prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our scripture reading for today comes from the New Testament. This is uh, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Paul was asked to write a letter to the church in Corinthians. It was a very strong church. However, they had many, many divisions and infighting. I, I know you can't imagine of that happening in a church, but it did uh, back in biblical days. And so Paul is writing to this church to encourage them. Please hear these words from 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 10 through 18. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and that there be no divisions among you, but that you may be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize but to proclaim the gospel, and not with the eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The word of God for the people of God, thanks be to God. Let us pray. 
Lord, I thank you so much for bringing us here as the body of Christ together to worship you. May we listen through our many thoughts. May we have open minds and open hearts that we might give glory to you. May my words be your words. Amen. So in our scripture today, as Jack has said, Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. Paul began this church in the biggest city in Greece, 50 miles west of Athens. And the population is a diverse one. It's filled with free and slave, Jew and Gentile, wealthy and not. People are giving their allegiance to different leaders of the church. And there is unsettled disagreement, which obviously is hurting the mission of the church. And the church's mission was to share Jesus' message, and it was getting lost in that, because of that situation. So there's a Jewish folklore passed around that describes a division in a congregation. So here it is. During a service at an old synagogue in Eastern Europe, when the Shema prayer was said, half the congregants stood up and half remained seated. The half that was seated started yelling at the ones that were, st that were standing, sit down, sit down. And the ones standing were motioning to the other people and yelling, stand up, stand up. So the rabbi, educated as he was in the law and the commentaries, he just didn't know what to do. His congregation suggested that he go find a homebound 98-year-old man who was considered to be very wise. He was one of the original founders of the temple. So they said, go and consult him. So the rabbi hoped that this elderly man could tell him what the actual temple tradition was, whether it was standing or sitting during this important prayer. So he goes to the nursing home with a representative of each of the factions, the sitters and the standers. The one who fall, whose followers stood during the Shema prayer said to the old man, is the tradition to stand during this prayer? The old man says, no, that's not the tradition. So you can imagine the sitters were very excited at this point. So they say, uh -huh. Is the tradition to sit? No, that's not the tradition. Well, they both look at each other, the sitter and the stander. The rabbi says, but the congregants fight all the time, yelling at each other about whether to, and the old man interrupts at that point and says, that's the tradition. <laughs> argue in church about some important things and some not so important things, importance of traditions or procedures, and they argue about theology. In Corinth, the people were lining up with their allegiances behind four main leaders. The leaders were not advocating these divisions. The people were identifying strongly with different approaches. In describing the dissension that arose, Paul uses the word schismata, which is the word for tears in a garment. The fabric of the church is what's being torn apart. Some people were following Apollos. Now, Apollos was a Jew from Alexandria. Alexandria was considered to be the very intellectual center. They loved literature and assigning symbols and deep meaning. It is thought that those that were following Apollos were intellectuals who were approaching Christianity more like a philosophy, very head-centered rather than a religion. Another group followed Cephas, the Greek name for Peter. Most likely they were Jews who emphasized the legalism of Jewish laws over the grace that was emphasized by Jesus. Others claimed their allegiance to Paul, and these were probably Gentiles, the name for non-Jews. Scholars suggest they were focusing on the aspect of Christian freedom, and by doing so, they thought, hey, we're offered freedom, freedom to do whatever we want, and then ask for forgiveness later. <laughs> the fourth group, 
claimed to belong to Christ. In other words, scholars think they may have been an intolerant group who thought they had the perfect understanding of Christ's message. They alone held the truth, no one else. And when you begin to have that, what does your mind do? It shrinks, and so does your heart. We can see that today, really. For throughout the Christian church, there has been and still is a division in not just procedure and tradition, but also in theology and biblical interpretation. We have people that believe they are the only champions and holders of the truth. This is the way it is. They think end of story, no discussion, just judgment with the idea we are the wise ones. So Christianity is more than wisdom. It's a way of living. It's a devotion to Christ who lived sacrificially and victorious over death. And that's what Paul is emphasizing to them. The importance of the belief in unconditional love. Sacrificial love as evidenced in God carnate. And that kind of love calls the people to a life of service rather than a life of fractures and tears. So Paul calls the Corinthians to unity, to be of the same mind. To be of the same mind? Well, that was difficult. And it still is difficult, don't you think? Same mind. You may know people, I do, that you feel like they can finish each other's sentences. They know what the other one's going to say. But it really doesn't mean they have the same mind. They just may be able to finish each other's sentences because they've been around each other for so long. It doesn't mean they have the same opinion. You know, and I, I see this all the time. Facebook, mainly in groups. I see those who do not agree with each other. And you think they might have a, a unifying part. So clergy groups, they really go at it. Tar Heel fans, oh my gosh. They go at each other so much, sometimes I just have to close it because each one of them is an expert coach and recruiter. <laughs> Solo stove groups. I don't know if any of you are a member of that, but people belittle each other about how they start their fire and, and how close their drink is to the fire. And they go on and on, disagreeing with each other and totally disrespectful. And just an aside, I also belong to a cockapoo group. They are kind. <laughs> if you want some just love and furry niceness, join a cockapoo group. <laughs> so Paul affirms that the church members have different gifts. He affirms you're, you're different, and each one of you has value to the whole. And he says he wishes them to be knit together, like bones after they've been fractured, knit together, healing. Reverend Hubert Beck calls out the Corinthian church, and I think for any church. Any church that uses their, quote, great disparity of gifts, interests, and emphases to schematically subdivide and turn their interest into power plays, their emphases into self-serving quests for a personal following, and their gifts into good works that give glory to themselves. While there are groups and subgroups within the church, Paul urges the Corinthians, be of the same mind. And that message is directed to us. As various scholars point out, being of the same mind does not mean having the exact same thoughts. Unity is not uniformity. Unity is not uniformity. In other words, people can have different opinions, but still be unified. So what do I mean by that? We must have the same purpose, to bring reconciliation to the world through Christ, to show love to all people in all situations. How we use our spiritual gifts, how we use our talents, how we use our opportunities either gives glory to God or it doesn't. How we speak to one another either gives glory to God or it doesn't. No one person has all the gifts. No one person can see all the angles of a situation. 
No one person is the model for handling all situations because we need each other. And we need to treat each other with respect, aware of these differences in style and personality, in our talents and our experiences. Paul speaks of unity in other letters. In Ephesians 4, he says, make every effort to be unified. One Lord, one baptism. Humility, patience, and tolerance are required, he says. In Colossians, he says, be patient and gentle, and especially be loving. And this will bring unity. Romans 15 says, unity is so that we can glorify God with one mind and one spirit. The American pastor, A.W. Tozer, described unity in the most beautiful way. And he begins by posing a question. He asks, has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos all tuned to the same fork are automatically tuned to each other? They are of one accord by being tuned not to each other, but to another standard to which each one must individually bow. So 100 worshipers meeting together, each one looking to Christ, are in heart nearer to each other than they could possibly be were they to become unity conscious and turn their eyes away from God to strive for closer fellowship. So the unity, where's it coming from? It's coming from Christ, right? That's the tune-in for what commandments come from Christ? You know them, two major, two major. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. So if we follow these commandments, will we be unified? Well, it's certainly a start. Love is the essence of God, and when we love, we bring reconciliation to the world. St. Augustine said love is like gravity. We are pulled toward what we love. If we're pulled toward God, then we become closer to each other. Now here's something that's difficult. You may see five people, all devoted Christians, all upholding love as their motivation, but coming up with completely different interpretations of a situation, or coming up with completely different solutions to a problem. Are they uniform in their solutions? No. But can they be unified in the search? Yes. Can they be unified in their respect? Yes. Sometimes it just seems so hard, doesn't it? So hard. Brene Brown gives some insight into how we have gotten so ununified. We've sorted ourselves into factions, she says, based on politics and ideology. We've turned away from one another and toward blame and rage. We're lonely and untethered and scared. Any answer to the question, how did we get here, is certain to be complex. She says, but if I had to identify one core variable that magnifies our compulsion to sort ourselves into factions, while at the same time cutting ourselves off from real connection with other people, my answer would be fear. Fear of vulnerability, fear of getting hurt, fear of the pain of disconnection, fear of criticism and failure, fear of conflict, fear of not measuring up. When we ignore fear and deny vulnerability, fear grows and it metastasizes. We move away from a belief in common humanity and unifying change and instead move into blame and shame. She says we will do anything that gives us a sense of more certainty and we will give our power to anyone who can promise easy answers and give us an enemy to blame. But I think that finding a common enemy doesn't mean we're unified, not really. So how can we work toward unity, not uniformity? Recently elected Bishop Tom Berlim describes in one of his books a trip he took to London. There he was warned at the Metro, mind the gap. 
people meant to be careful around that gap between the station curb and the metro so you don't fall in, <clears throat> twist your leg, or worse, get stuck and run over. Mind the gap. You know, it's good advice for us too, even if we're not getting on a metro. We must try to understand someone else's perspective because there's a gap between our perspective and someone else's. So we have to try to understand someone else's perspective and to understand their experiences that might have led them to their opinion or their stance. What's the first step of that? We have to listen. And when I say listen, it's not trying to think of a rebuttal or an argument to rebut what somebody's saying while they're talking. You ever done that? You hear, you see their mouth moving <laughs> and thinking, thinking, thinking. But listening with our minds open and our mouths closed. Minds open, mouths closed, listening. Last year we offered a seminar about school violence and the use of guns and we talked about our feelings of hopelessness and our own responses to that and the church's response. What is the Christian response? Jerry Chancellor had some great insight in working through hot issues, issues where we find ourselves quite often divided. He said that finding common language is vital. For example, the term security, it may mean one thing to one person and something to another, and you're having a whole conversation about security meaning something else. Freedom can have different meanings. And it's so important to define terms and the defining can really break down a heated debate until the participants realize that they weren't even using the terms in the same way. So finding common language and understanding perspective can help to bring unity. Finding common language takes risks. It means being willing to remove labels and see beyond them. It means not lumping people together with, with labels like conservative, liberal, hardhead, fanatic, kook. Isn't that a good one? It's just a kook. Being of the same mind doesn't mean uniformity, but it means embracing a sense of belonging. Brene Brown again emphasizes the importance of true belonging. She says true belonging is not passive. It's not the belonging that comes with just joining a group. It's not fitting in or pretending or selling out because it's safer. It's a practice that requires us to be vulnerable. You hear that word again? Vulnerable. Get uncomfortable and learn how to be present with people without sacrificing who we are. If we're going to change what is happening in a meaningful way, we're going to need to intentionally be with people who are different from us. We're going to have to sign up and join and take a seat at the table. We're going to have to learn how to listen, have hard conversations, look for joy, share pain, and be curious, more curious than defensive, all while seeking moments of togetherness. So ministers of Shady Grove, it's up to all of us to create an environment of belonging here for people to feel safe in sharing their thoughts and beliefs, for people to encourage each other to grow in faith, for people to offer signs of hope that they see in their own lives and then, and then what they see in the lives of others. And when we do it here, when we do it at our church, we are training ourselves to do it in the workplace, to do it in the world, to do it at the soccer game or dance recitals. This is the training ground for that. We're different. We are, we're created to be different and that's okay. I was driving by Glen Allen High School this week and I love what's on their school sign for the community to see. It says, one team, one heartbeat, one family. We are too are called to have one heartbeat, aren't we? The heartbeat of love, one family serving each other, responding to the needs of others. Each piano tuned to the same fork, tuned to Jesus, and therefore in tune with each other. May our music be unique, may our music be melodious, and most of all, may our music be harmonious.
Amen. Please join me as we confess our faith. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, you have called us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ, to continue his work of reconciliation and reveal you to the world. Forgive us the sins which tear us apart. Give us the courage to overcome our fears and to seek that unity which is your gift and your will. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, you call us to do tough things. You ask us to listen when we don't want to. You ask us to reach out to people that we have labeled as hard hit. You ask us to be vulnerable, and Lord, that is hard. But you ask us to tune our hearts to Jesus. You sent Jesus to show us how to, how to live, how to love. And may we be bold enough to do that. And may we be bold enough to pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. We have a great and wonderful God, who in darkness and the void created our earth and everything in it, and created us. He is an abundant God who continues to give and provide for us daily. And this is our opportunity to give a small portion back and thank you to God for what he has done for us. You may place your offering in the offering plates as they're passed through the church, or you may text SERVE to 73256 for a secure link to give.
Mercy. <laughs> Get myself back together again. Okay. Doxology. Grace. Let's start again. Let's start again. <laughs> join together in the prayer of dedication. Holy God, as we present our tithes and offerings in worship, we know we come from a world that is breaking apart. Remind us that you desire one mind from your children, not a church void of disagreement, but one where we work at listening in love more than working at speaking louder and winning the day. We dedicate not just our gifts, but our minds to the work of your unifying love. In Christ we pray, amen. Remain standing for our closing hymn, Softly and Tenderly, stanzas one, two, and four, hymn number 348. And tenderly Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home. Come home, you are weary, come home, earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, oh sinner, come home. is pleading, pleading for you and for me. Why should we linger and heed not his mercies, mercies for you and for me? Come home, come home. Oh!
today. I encourage you to stop by the Welcome Center uh, to see Judy Gillis, uh, where we might learn a little bit more about you and that you can ask some questions about us. We would love to get to know you. Want you to know that confirmation will be getting very, very soon. It's for seventh graders and up from 415 to 545 in the doghouse, beginning March 5th. And then we will have our um, confirmation Sunday will be on Pentecost, which is a, a tradition. But we, it's not tradition we argue about. It's just a tradition. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we are offering an opportunity, a three-week series on Mondays beginning February 6th, led by Pastor Chris, uh, called Community Hope in the Midst of Addiction. It's an opportunity to better understand those who are affected or, or get help yourself or for your loved ones. We'll learn about addiction, how to help someone struggling, and learn the resources that are available. So please, this is not just for our church. Uh, please share that with someone that you think could really grow from that. So this week, I encourage you to, to be a piano tuned to Jesus. Think of something this week that you're going to do that brings you closer to Jesus, whether it be a devotion, whether it be blessing someone in a certain way whether it means listening to a podcast on faith. Do something intentional to tune yourself to Jesus because when we tune ourselves to Jesus, we are all tuned together. So go forth to live and love. Amen. Amen.